Large language leaderboards and the benchmarks that drive them are a great way to identify the current state of the art, whether it's with big closed source models like GPT-4 and Cloud-3, or with open source models. And although it's great to have a relative ground truth to compare these models against each other, a lot of the progress that happens with these models is iterative. So the idea that the best model a week before it becomes first in a leaderboard will always be within the top even 10% of a leaderboard really isn't that likely. This isn't really a trend we see with closed source source AI because those releases are always polished, but generally speaking, the highest performance open LLMs or open source fine tunes that combine the best of open source with new ideas to see what we can eke out of them, generally speaking, will slowly move their way up the leaderboard as the developer figures out what they're doing and as they understand what the real strengths of a model are. There are also certain instances where benchmarks aren't actually good at benchmarking certain things like relative creativity or even certain pretty obvious forms of logical reasoning ability. And today, I want to talk about that. So if you follow the Twitter account OpenLLM Leaders, you might wonder why sometimes they even bother posting a tweet when a new model is added that's 400th in the class of, say, 7 billion parameter models. And this is why you have to dig a little bit deeper, because benchmarks aren't perfect, and sometimes aiming to have the most general benchmark possible isn't actually the best. So the model I want to talk about today is one of those models. It scores 66.62, and the aggregate score across ARC, Helleswag, MMLU, and a few others. And it's called Einstein V4 by 7B, and it's trying to do something a little bit different. So so what is this model? Why is it incredible? What is it actually trying to prove up? And should you use it? Welcome to AI Flux. Let's get into it. So the name of this model is Einstein V47B, and the org that developed this describes this as a powerful Mistral-based supervised fine-tuned model, or SFT model, using diverse high-quality and filtered open-source datasets. And they also brag about having converted multiple-choice datasets to longer responses with Mistral. But so what's cool is this is using a combination of synthetic data generated with Mistral, so itself being an open-source LLM, and also making a point to, generally speaking, only use different diverse high quality open source data sets, not closed data sets or data sets from other closed source LLMs. And the development of this is still in progress. So obviously it's not even within the top 15% of 7 billion parameter models on the Hugging Face open LLM leaderboard. That said, it's still quite capable. So Wex AI says that this model has been fully fine tuned using Oxalotl for 1.5 epochs using ChatML as its prompt template, which is pretty cool. Again, a cool trend to see in open source models. Curiously, this model still performs quite well. I know you'd think that quite well would be well within the top 10% of a given model category, but it's pretty great. And the big push here is that it surpasses many other SFT models of the 7 billion parameter size, which is really impressive. And I'm going to get into that just a bit later. What's also really interesting is the open source community and AI developers have already started breaking this into tons of different quantized versions and also different formats. There's already a GDUF format, an AWQ format, and an EXL2 format all created by different developers, not Weya, which is kind of cool. And generally speaking, you know that if Eric Hartford is in your comments saying it's a good model, then it's probably a pretty good model. And I say that just having covered a lot of Eric's work, and a lot of the models we review on this channel are directly downstream from Eric's work. And the Hugging Face page gives us a bit more information about this model. So obviously, initially, we just have a safe tensors format. And what's interesting is how Hugging Face has gotten a lot better at showing us kind of what made a model work. So obviously, we know this is fine fine-tuned from Mistral AI's Mistral 7B, and the data sets here were Kika, Allen AI A2 Arc, and Open Orca Slim Orca, which is pretty cool. And they also show the most recent evaluation results. In my opinion, the most impressive, at least generalized benchmark is, is the MMLU score of 62.3, and Hella Swag with 83.75. It's also cool to see here that the model was fine-tuned only using seven RTX 3090s and one RTX A6000 using Oxalotl. This is really cool because it shows how within reach a lot of this work can be. There's kind of a back and forth, especially in spaces like Hacker News among developers as to whether or not fine-tuning models can actually unlock new abilities and models for just normal developers, basically someone who doesn't have the amount of compute that, say, Stability AI or Anthropic has. But this shows that you really can do this. I mean, 7390s is still relatively expensive, but that's still cheaper than 
buying a single A100 secondhand on eBay. And we've been getting a lot of requests to make more to make more content about these kind of higher end machines you can use on your own, um, kind of in a home lab or uh, as a workstation. So let us know in the comments if you wanna see more about that. We do have a few of those in the pipeline right now. So again, the prompt template is chat ML. And it's cool to see that a lot of these initially kind of gray area formats are starting to formalize. And formalization is important in open source and in open models because it means, because it means that the accuracy of development will improve and that the efficiency and speed will continue to increase, which I think is pretty cool. Basically because people have to spend less work building interop layers or manually churning through data sets to make them work with each other. Also, ChatML, I think, is a better way to instruct models. Um, in the same way that learning C++, I think, is best before learning Python, I think starting with ChatML and really strict system prompts is actually a much better way to understand how you should instruct a model to give you what you want. And again, they mentioned the quantized versions here. And what's also cool is they mentioned kind of the rough amount of RAM you need to run these. So for the 8-bit quantization, we're looking at right around 8 to 12 gigs, all the way down to the 3.5-bit quantization, which really you only need 4.5 to around 8 gigs, which I think is pretty cool because you can run it. So there's a little bit of insight in the comments from someone showing some examples, and then I'm going to get into a few examples of my own. So here, the user prompt is answer the following questions. There are a few kind of basic math questions mixed with some English. Then there's some more complex word problems, some relatively basic um, function calling. So asking how long it takes to travel from New York to London. Some other kind of really curious ones that are basic reasoning in chemistry, looking at kind of a, an, an acid and base interaction. Then some translation prompts. So showing that this model in theory should be capable in a general sense. Now, the math ones are pretty straightforward. I mean, even one bit LLMs at this point can solve basic math and do some of these basic word problems. The function calling prompt is pretty cool. Seven hours is roughly accurate. What's also cool is that this model had enough context to understand that the interaction between these two chemicals is actually what creates aspirin. It didn't really articulate this right, but the output was correct. And we were able to translate this simple phrase I love you into five different European languages, which is pretty cool. What's good is the model is relatively succinct. We'll have to see if this model handles uh, multi-step reasoning relatively well, but I'm excited to see how this model performs, especially since the level of developers in the comments that are excited about this uh, is really pretty high. So while I'm waiting for this VM to spin up, I want to talk about why SFT matters, what the benefits of it are, and why it's kind of different from generic fine-tuning. So SFT just stands for supervised fine-tuning. So it's still fine tuning, just it's a little bit different. The idea here is that the first training step within the alignment process is done with really good data, but the data points to more than just a specific task. So the biggest part of SFT is curating a data set of high quality LLM outputs that are basically just examples of the, L of the LLM behaving properly or exactly how you want it to for a number of tasks, not just one specific subset. Then we fine tune over those examples and we see what happens. The supervised aspect of this is just from the fact that we're collecting a data set of examples that the model should emulate and then the model learns to replicate the style. And again, not just one skill. So the real difference here is in the data and just having high quality data doesn't necessarily cut it. It has to be diverse and cover a number of things that actually differ quite radically in certain cases from what you actually want it to do. So for instance, if I wanted to use SFT to make a model better at math, it actually benefits in some ways to add a lot of stuff around that. For instance, uh, understanding word problems or understanding how math can be used to do things like figure out how much flour you need to bake a cake. As a result, you get cross pollination and that's right now why we think SFT is better than just generic fine-tuning. So obviously fine-tuning existed before SFT since SFT is just a version of fine-tuning. And the reason fine-tuning is sometimes limited is fine-tuning as a way of improving performance was initially not really meant for generative or creative AI in terms of the tasks we use. Initially it was just meant for encoder-only models like BERT that were great at recalling information but not necessarily creating new information. And typically fine-tuning in, in the past is I said, was only done to deep learning models to teach a model how to solve a specific task, but as a result, it makes the model more specialized and less generic, and you end up with kind of LLM tunnel vision, which we would technically call a narrow expert model. So the model will more likely solve the task, uh, which is fine-tuned more accurately, and SFT will give us a much more generic output, which is pretty cool. Now, there's still pros and cons to SFTs, but the biggest pro 
is that it's a pretty easy way given the amount of time you put into tuning up the data that you get really good generic performance, generally speaking. And also it's really computationally cheap. Generally speaking, uh, 100 times less expensive than other versions of fine tuning. And what's also cool is RLHF is not necessarily needed. Uh, you can add RLHF or real life human feedback to SFT, but generally speaking, um, in my opinion, you get cleaner outputs if you don't use it. And this has been a relatively recent advancement, uh, say in the last six months or so, realizing that sometimes adding more human input doesn't actually make these models better. So in other words, SFT is a highly effective technique for improving the quality of any language model. However, it's still not perfect, and this model just happens to showcase one of the times that it works really well. All right, so I'm gonna start with the basic prompt that is a little complex. Basically, I'm asking it to be an assistant for help with geography questions. And since I was talking with a friend the other day about geography where he wanted to build a cabin, I figured I would ask, if I'd like to build a home on a solid rock foundation, where in the US should I consider building? So let's see how this goes. All right, here we go. So the system prompt has worked. It says, if I'd like to build a home on solid rock foundation, where should I consider building? And here we go. So it says, if you're looking to build a home on solid rock foundation in the United States, there are several regions that are best known for their stable geology. Colorado for solid bedrock and the front range in two specific areas. New Hampshire, saying it has a tagline of the Granite State, which is kind of interesting. I actually didn't know that. And then Vermont for having stable bedrock. And they gave us a specific region in the Green Mountains region. So this is pretty impressive. I mean, for a 7 billion parameter model that's pretty low in the rankings in terms of the LLL leaderboard, this is what I mean by the leaderboard ranking doesn't always directly correlate with usability or performance. I sometimes argue that performance and usability are also two different things we should be benchmarking in two very different ways as well. So let me try another one. All right, so I'm gonna try something with cooking. South America and want to bake. So basically asking, I'm trying to do something that I normally would do in the West. I'm now in South America, so the available grain might be different. Let's see what we get here. And here we go. So if you're in South America and want to bake sourdough, you should start by gathering ingredients. Okay, so we're gonna see if it gives us the right ingredients along with the starter, since that's actually pretty important. All right, so it show. okay, so that, that's good. Uh, filtered or unfiltered water. A little risque there, inferring that South America might have clean water, but yeah, that's that's fair. Good, so it shows, us how to, it shows us how to make the starter. Starter is a mixture of flour and water that has been fermented with by wild yeast, and then use salt. So I think, yeah, we're still going here. All right, so uh, proofing basket or bowl, baking stone or sheet, parchment paper, or silicone baking mat. And now it's giving us this, okay, cool, very cool. So the output context here is a little bit limited, but this is pretty impressive. So even though this model isn't instruct tuned, clearly this is pretty usable. It understood where we were geographically, it understood why we maybe would need to make some adjustments. And overall, I'm pretty impressed. I think some people might be less inclined uh, because you have to use this kind of chat ML format. But granted, most front ends, for those of you who don't know, are just doing this under the hood and they're just kind of adding this text around your prompt when you click submit. And then when they present it, they're just removing this extra text that you get back from the raw model. So this model is pretty cool, honestly. Um, I will link to this deep learning focus below from Cameron Wolf. Uh, his Substack is really useful and definitely consider subscribing to him if you like uh, his really like balanced descriptions of a lot of otherwise really technical stuff when it comes to LLMs and AI. I think Einstein V47B is impressive because it shows that even though it was way down in the rankings, big time AI developers on Twitter still noticed it and the traction and usability it's getting is really quite good. So I'm gonna keep messing around with this. Uh, I'm curious if you guys would use this model or if you might plan on fine tuning this even further. Uh, what skills do you wanna see? Uh, are there certain things you wanna see me benchmark more than others? Uh, if you want me to not benchmark bread questions, I can also improve on that if you'd like. But yeah, so as always, I hope you learned something in this video. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, and share as it helps us out a ton. We just surpassed 10,000 subscribers and we're incredibly excited to get to the next 100,000 with all of you supporting our channel. So thanks so much and we'll see you in the next one.